Welcome to Voices of Experience, the official podcast of the National Speakers Association. I'm your host, technology strategist and futurist, Crystal Washington. Today, we're going to take a look at your speaker foundation. Being grounded in purpose keeps individuals and organizations from straying in times of challenges. Our guest today knows something about having a strong foundation as a speaker, as he was a charter member of the National Speakers Association 47 years ago, and he still has a robust speaking business today, right now in 2020. Are you ready? Let's go. Today on Voices of Experience, we are very fortunate to have Don Hudson, CSP, CPAE, Cabot Award winner. He was on the founding board of NSA and was a charter member. Don, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Crystal. It's my pleasure. (laughs) Well, today we're really focusing on our foundation as speakers and as someone who is a charter member of NSA, and I think you're our third president as well, I feel like you have a lot of insights to share. So is it okay if we kind of tap into your wonderful career to get, gain your uh, perspective? <laughs> Absolutely. These, these are fond <laughs> memories, so I'm happy to revisit them. Oh, perfect, perfect. So for those of us that are newer speakers, right, maybe we've only been around for, for 10 years or less, when you think about the founding of NSA. Why was the National Speakers Association created? Well, Cavett Robert, our founder, was such a remarkable guy in so many ways, but he had such a giving spirit, and he's all, he was always thinking about what can I do for somebody else, and what can I do for our profession, what can I do that needs to be done, and he was a, a noble thinker, and, and he thought that uh, we should have a professional trade association, and that if we all get together, we could uh, do something for the speaking profession that could be profound over time, so he started to talking to a lot of his friends. Now, in those days, uh, Kevin and I had a wonderful friendship, but he was also a mentor. And I also used him when I I was a seminar promoter in the early days before I became a professional speaker, and I hired him uh, quite frequently to speak on my programs. So we had a multifaceted relationship and became very close friends. But uh, he shared that vision with me. He said, Don, we need to start the National Speakers Association. And he said, I want to get your help on this. He said, we've got a good nucleus of people who I think are interested in doing it, and and we'll make a Bill Gove, our first president, because everybody knows and loves Bill. He was a very prominent uh, person in the profession at that time. And he said he'll be perfect because everybody will enjoy rallying around Bill and his vision. Mm -hmm. And then we need to bring uh, some prestige to the table. So we'll get Dr. Carl Winters to be our second president. He's on the General Motors speaker staff and a a theologian and a wonderfully skilled speaker. So uh, he was number two number two in line. Then he said, for our third president, we need somebody who's young and full of energy. And he said, I think that needs to be you, Don. So it was almost like it was predestined in those days. And Mm. uh, from Cavett's standpoint, he just put it all together. Everybody did what he said do. So Mm. uh, it was a wonderful thing. And we got, uh, I think we had about a dozen people on our founding board. I remember that first board meeting was in the fall of 1973 at the O'Hare Hilton in Chicago. We're all traveling traveling a lot in those days, and he thought that'd be a good place for us to meet. So he set the date, and of the, um, I think, 13, 14 people he invited to be on the original board, I want to say a dozen showed up, and we had a wonderful meeting, and everybody was all energized about starting the National Speakers Association. Then somebody said, well, you know, if we're going to do this, we need some money. Why don't we all throw in $500 a piece? And everybody got real quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> $500 is a lot of money in 1973, but we did it. And that was the nucleus with which we started the National Speakers Association. We had our first uh, convention in 1974 in Scottsdale. And uh, every year thereafter, and I'm told I'm the only person who's ever been to all, all of our meetings. So that's kind of a neat thing. I'm going to oh, make wow. sure I don't break the, break that record. I'm going to keep it going as long as I can. 
I love it. That's kind of what the early days were about. And we had so many energized people who wanted to get in and help. And, and if we'd asked somebody to speak on the national convention, everybody was eager to do it. We paid no speaker's fees. Everybody just wanted to help. And mm-hmm. we all learned from each other. And it was, it was a great thing. Now, when you think of the foundation of NSA, what was it that NSA was trying to accomplish for individual speakers? Does that, does that make sense as I'm asking that question? Like, what, what were they trying to, what were you all trying to envision for speakers themselves to, to make them better? What was considered progress then? That's a great question, Crystal. And uh, there's a term that's been used a lot through the years, and it was Cavett's term. He said, we need to, to create more awareness for professional speaking. And he said, this is not about us competing with each other. Let's let's create a bigger pie, and we'll all get a nice slice. And uh, the whole idea of creating the bigger pie was to create more awareness of professional speakers and uh, more standards and ideas and concepts of what we could do to advance the profession. So, so Cavett was quite instrumental in making all of that happen. And then he surrounded himself with some sharp people who contributed additional ideas. And before you knew it, NSA was on a roll. Wow. Now, how have you seen the speaking business change over the years? I mean, because there's there have been so many bumps and and just different things that have happened along the way. I mean, you've had a, a very lasting career, whereas some of us that are newer you know, we've only seen so many years. And so like right now it, it's looking pretty terrifying, but tell me about your perspective over the years. Take me back from 1973 until now. What does that look like? Well, it's the whole profession has changed enormously, as you can imagine. And I feel like I've reinvented myself about a half a dozen times, most recently this year mm. <laughs> with all the craziness that's been going on. But uh, I, th- I think the key, Crystal, is we've got to always be asking our- ourselves the question: How can I maximize my value to the, the, my value I bring to the table for my clients? And if we're always focusing on that, we're going to figure out a delivery system. We're going to figure out a methodology. We're going to work with our clients and assess their needs, their desires, and and do the best job we can of addressing them. And I think that's been true for many, many years. Now, sometimes there's some people they get in one groove and. And uh, I'll use the example of a speaker who has one one hour speech Mm -hmm. and they say, you know, it's easier to change your audience than it is to change your speech. And it's a wonderful speech. And then they just go out and give that speech. Well, the question becomes, is that person altering that speech content over time to maximize its pertinence uh, in a changing marketplace? And that's got to be key. And I know I started off as I was known as a sales trainer for many years. I did sales rallies and I did uh, annual sales meetings for companies. And then there was a point in time in the uh, late 70s where I thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to start doing some leadership speaking and training too. So I did my research, did my homework and, and started uh, developing some content around leadership and management. Mm -hmm. So uh, that expanded my, my base a bit of my capabilities of what I could do for a client. Now, fast forward to today with all the changes we've got going on, we've got to accept the fact that if we're going to deal with a changing environment, Crystal, we've got to, to do everything we can to, to do our homework, Okay. to learn all we can learn, not only about things related to content and how we can maximize our value to clients, but how about our platforms that are our basis of uh, presenting our various deliverables. That means we've got to learn about technology. We've got to know uh, the the whys and wherefores of everything ab- about Zoom and, and some of the other platforms and do what we can to maximize our value to the client. That's the key. They continue to have needs even under COVID and under an ever-changing marketplace, they continue to have needs. So we've got to ask ourselves, what can I do to respond to those needs and and learn more along the way so that I've got solid, pertinent, up-to-date content? You know, Don, what I love about what you just said, I love how you tied in the shifts over the years to what's going on now. Can you think of a time in the last, you know, you've, you've spoken now for, it's getting close to 50 years if we count the time before you were you know, a, a, a charter member of NSA. So this is, I love it. It's phenomenal. Can you think of any times historically where speakers or the industry at large was really nervous? 
Yeah, and I'd say the biggest transition, Crystal, was many years ago, a meeting planner had a slot on his meeting agenda, and he wanted to, to hire a speaker who he had heard was good. Mm-hmm. And that was really basic back in those days. But as basic as it was, that word of mouth of, you know, that person's really good. You know, that word gets around and it gets a lot of speakers, a lot of business for many years. But what happened is, I want to say maybe around the late 80s, early 90s, there started to be, started to become a new trend. of Rather than finding a, a speaker to fill a slot on an agenda, they're trying to find an, uh, a person who's going to help them solve some very significant problems they've got. So it becomes a more substantive issue of what are our deliverables? What do we bring to the table that represents solutions to timely and up-to-date problems? And that's the reason that the really good speakers, they don't worry about changing and updating their speech and, and building content as a problematical issue. They see it as an opportunity because that's the, main, the way we maintain our relevance to our clients in changing times. So today, people are looking for, for solutions to problems. Hmm. So it, it sounds like there was a major shift in the 80s to a little bit more from the maybe performance aspect to looking for more content. I know we've been through multiple recessions, uh, which I would imagine impacts speaking yep. as well. You know, you mentioned how we need to shift so that we're always offering maximum value to clients. But there's something else that you said that I wanted us to just kind of zoom in on a little bit. You said that at the beginning of the founding of NSA, Two of the main purposes for the organization was to raise awareness around professional speaking and to set standards to advance the profession. What occurred to me, Don, is that right now in the age of virtual events where it's still the wild, wild west, it's not that we've never had them, but on this level, we haven't had anything like this. It seems like now we have a renewed opportunity to raise awareness about the value of professional speakers in the virtual space and standards to advance the profession in the virtual space. I I feel like this is a a wonderful chance to kind of do what we started off doing in the very beginning of the organization. Right. I I think what's happening is we've got just a total shift of what's going on. And it's really come to a head in in 2020 with the uh, pandemic. But I think we've got to just continue to become more and more knowledgeable, more and more of a subject matter expert Mm -hmm. so that we can be more and more helpful to our clients. Now, I'm not going to say anything to to denounce the performance aspect of our business, Crystal, because Mm -hmm. that is still critical. The person who who is a great performer Mm -hmm. and also has a great and very timely message is the person who's going to win a ton of business. Mm -hmm. So I think we've still got to see the performance aspect as critical. But we've got to be more substantive experts in many different arenas that we've chosen to represent ourselves as. So then what what I'm understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying is that the purpose is still there. It's still about adding value. And you mentioned that some of the best speakers you've seen didn't see it as a task. It was just a part of evolving. So exactly. is this just another piece of the evolution for speaking? Is is this a challenge or is this an opportunity for us to evolve some more? I think it's a challenge and an opportunity. But we need to, I've used an old phrase through the years, Crystal, that uh, we need to do all we can so that we can experience a life where, in a, where we are in a, not a prison in which to labor, but a garden in which to bloom. Mm. Well, if we're going to be in the garden and enjoy every day of our lives, we got to keep getting smarter. We've got to got to increase our value to our clients. We've got to enjoy uh, the the advantages of reading and have a hunger for knowledge. And, you know, that's the way I've reinvented myself through the years. And right now I'm generating some decent revenues online and with virtual meetings and that type thing that uh, we continue to sell, sell the value of our content and our solutions and our deliverables. We just have a different delivery system today than we had a year ago. Mm. You know, Don, I don't even know if, if there's too much we can say more than what you just said right there. I think that was really what we all needed to hear so that we can focus on the fact that we still have value. We just have to shift or not even necessarily just shift, but we have to look for opportunities to update our delivery systems. But in closing, if, if you had to give everyone listening just one piece of advice, one more piece of advice, what would that be, Don? I would say have more in-depth 
conversations with your clients and prospects. Try to ask them the most thoughtful questions you possibly can, because the better the questions you ask, the the better the answers you're going to get and the more in-depth information you're going to receive in the process. And we need to be so good at needs assessment, Crystal, that we will uh, single-handedly become a powerful resource to a client just as they, as they realize we're learning more and more about their business and we're becoming a, a more valuable resource as time goes by. I've had some clients I've had for many years. And it's because I've gotten to know their business. I've gotten to know them. I've, I've earned the right to gain trusted advisor status. And as a result of that, they continue to come to me for solutions. So it's good to have some of that going on. And, you know, one of the keys is it's incumbent upon us to make sure we stay in touch with past clients. Mm-hmm. You know, the CEO of, of HubSpot, the, the Internet marketing company, says the currency of the future is your database. Hey, don't be among the people who let the contacts with past clients uh, dissipate over time. Let's make sure we're staying in touch with people and developing a powerful database. And let's stay in touch with folks. Are you a CSP, Certified Speaking Professional, or a CPAE, part of the Speaker Hall of Fame? If so, it's not too late to network with the top speakers in our industry to find new ways to maximize your value to clients. The CSP CPAE Virtual Summit takes place on November 14th. This just might be the most economical summit we've ever had. To register, please visit nsaspeaker.org and click on the events tab. Thank you for tuning in to Voices of Experience, the podcast of the National Speakers Association. Catch us on your favorite podcast app, YouTube, and NSA's social media profiles. I'll see you next week.